Hello and welcome to episode number 289 of the Armin Show podcast, where it's always informative, lively, and different. I have many books in my background. Professor Daniel T. Blumstein also has many books in the background. He is my guest for this episode. Glad to have you on the show. Thanks for having me. This is a cool thing. We like books. Long live them. Now, I looked at your research, which I tend to do when I am speaking with people, and you have so much. And over many years and a variety of topics you have covered. So first, I'd like to go back into how did you get to where you are? How would you describe that as far as your educational route? So I'm a behavioral ecologist and a conservation scientist. And I've always been passionate about wildlife and animals and going to college, I thought if you studied biology, you had to go to medical school or something like that, probably like many people, Mm -hmm. and then had an influential mentor, actually I had two influential mentors as an undergraduate. One of them was Mark Beckoff, and I took a course early on with him um, on animal behavior. Um, And I sort of realized, hey, this is kind of, I didn't know you could, you know, study animal behavior and make a career out of that. And I ended up volunteering for him and working in other labs at Boulder, where I was an undergrad and uh, ended up doing an honors project. And I've always been sort of driven to do my own work um, and found people to support me and, you know, helping make me better at what I was doing. So I early got early on got into research as an undergrad. And then um, I used to get paid to bicycle around the world and I was biking around and I knew that I wanted to do international wildlife conservation. Um, and I uh, sort of stumbled on this national park in uh, the Pakistan Chinese border region of the Karakor Mountains, and there were big marmots there, and there were predators. I'm like, what a great place to, you know, look at um, animals and what a neat park and what a fun place to work. So I ended up working there for a while. This is a cool thing. You mentioned marmots. As I read through your material and look at your research, I notice you have worked with a variety of animals, marmots being one of the favorites. Why? Have you selected various animals of sorts to look at and how closely would you say they are generally linked to us as far as their adaptations and our adaptations? Well, I um, have an inordinate fondness for marmots, you might say, um, because marmots um, are diurnal. They're active during the day. They have an address so you can um, follow them for, you know, uh, mark them and then follow individuals. Mm-hmm. Um, I actually am really conceptually oriented and I, uh, I, I, I study things to answer general questions. So my behavioral work is really inspired by, you know, how can we explain the diversity of behavior? What are the rules that, um, that, that, that allow us to understand why some animals are different and some animals are similar? How do we make sense of all this variation? So some people go out and measure biodiversity. I look at behavioral diversity. I look at biodiversity too. But, um, you know, and, and, and there are rules and ways of thinking about this conceptually. And um, for certain questions, some species are good. For other questions, other species are good. And uh, I'm just, you know, I, I'm, I'm interested in lots of things. So if I, for different questions, I, I focus on different animals. That makes sense. Now, your book that has just come out is called The Nature of Fear. I've always been very inclined towards books that connect with the topic of fear. It's one of my main categories of interest or that I connect with. What is a way that fear is represented in organisms? What kind of biochemical pathways come forward when someone is in fear? So I'm sure everyone's had a fight or flight response. I mean, you know, you sort of hit the brakes and almost hit somebody, and then you have this amazing surge of adrenaline. So um, fear in, is a very adaptive um, homeostatic response, really, to um, challenges, external threats. And um, the book really capitalizes on the diversity of animals and plants, actually, that my students and I have studied over the years and that friends and colleagues study as well to really try to understand, give give a biological basis on our own fears. So many um, evolutionary psychologists focus, try to understand who we are and why we behave the way we behave 
by looking at ancestral humans, and that's fine. Um, and some evolutionary psychologists look back at our primate ancestors, and that's fine. But really, fear is one of these things that goes back, you know, to when you started having a, 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 a specialized nervous system. As soon as you could specialize functions, as soon as energy had to be allocated differently to different cells and organs, um, anti-predator, and, and as soon as things started eating things, um, anti-predator behavior uh, evolved. So anti-predator behavior has been around for millions of years. And remarkably, many of these neural circuits and vertebrates, at least, and neurochemicals are pretty conserved. Uh, the adrenalines, the glucocorticoids, like you know cortisol, um, the brain, the parts of the brain, like the amygdala, um, in, in species that have amygdalas, um, you know, are, are, are used, um, are, are stimulated, are activated when animals get afraid of things. And typically these are predatory fears. Um, these are responses that are highly adapted to allow animals to escape predators. And pretty much everything has predators at some point in its life. So maybe, I, I posit, and I think the answer is yes, um, you know, we can look at the diversity of anti-predator behavior and gain insights into who we are and why we behave the way we behave. So that's how the, the book is sort of, that's the broad overview of the book. Mm -hmm. As I was looking through the book, I like it, it takes it through predators, like imagining a animal flying above you and you'd have to observe it. And then our response as far as speed of response. One thing that I always think about, this is uh, before the book, when I think of fear, if someone causes you fear and it sort of subjugates you, is it fair to say something like you got cortical steroided by them? You could. I mean, there's a whole suite of things. Um, and, and, you know, glucocorticoids are some of those things. Um, other, there are other chemicals as well involved in this. And, but, but yeah, I mean, um, when you get a dose of adrenaline, um, when your body, the fight or flight response really changes uh, your energy allocation to one of preparing for escape. So your immune system is not active. It's sort of the immune system is suppressed, but you know, your eyes open up and you can see, and you can, you know, you suddenly can smell when you get that surge of glucocorticoids and adrenaline and, you know, your senses are heightened and energy is rushing to muscles to, to, you know, to big muscles like legs and arms to get you out of there. Um, I opened the book with a story that, and the book has lots of stories to sort of motivate questions to, you know, go into um, uh, sections, but I opened the, the book with a story when I was studying monkey behavior in Kenya. I also was bicycling in Kenya, and I was taking time off, and I was down uh, bicycling out of Mombasa on the, on the coastal Kenya, going south towards the um, Tanzanian border, and I was going to go to some parks and um, try to get into parks, which is sort of hard if you're on a bicycle because you're not really supposed to bicycle in national parks in Kenya because animals will eat you. Um, and, you know, I also was trying to uh, go to some beaches and things like that. So I'm, my bike's really loaded down. I'm biking alone and it's hot and it's, you know, not a lot of traffic on the road. And I'm biking slowly uphill and I see some three guys in the distance and I get near them and I'm like, Jumbo, you know, hello. And they don't respond, and I thought that was weird because people had found me, you know, to be an oddity and look at sort of a. This is 1986. It's a mountain bike. It looks like a motorcycle. So they'd, they'd say I was a PK PK, and I said motorcycle. I'm like, you know, no, no, no. It's banana powered PK PK because all I did was eat bananas to keep going, because um, the little bananas in Kenya are amazing. In any event, I've got bananas tied on my bike. I've got <laughs> water. I've got all sorts of things, and I'm biking slowly up this hill, and you know, these guys don't say hello. And I'm like, oh, whatever. And I, as I'm getting near them, I sort of look out of the corner of my eye and they're lifting this huge rock and tossing it at my head. And I sort of put my shoulder up and blocked it. And, um, you know, my bike was real, the center of gravity was really low. And I got this adrenaline rush because they started glaring at me and chasing me. And I just motored up this hill and got out of there. And I've never had such an adrenaline rush in my life. And I would say my fear um, of bodily harm or worse um, you know, got me out of there. And uh, fear is a very adaptive response. So, you know, we are who we are um, because our ancestors um, were fearful, but they were wisely fearful. They didn't unnecessarily overestimate risks. They managed risks. And 
one of the you know, themes is how animals manage risks, how they trade off risk versus reward. And I discussed that in the context of lots of examples. Mm -hmm. I do like looking at the trade-off because there's clearly a cost to having all your systems alive and energized for activity, more vigilance than your normal peaceful state, a lot more energy. The eyes take a lot of energy and also the sense of being ready to go. And then I like how you said it was down regulated uh, by homeostatic processes that keep it. It's almost like a little protective feature that we have it at times, but then it's not to be used much. One thought that came to my mind was how much is, let's say for animals, their early impacts of fear connected to how they will be later on, like in their first years of life or first months, if it's a short-lived organism, how much does that stay in their brain so that even later on they have sort of like a twitch response to fear? Yeah, so um, you know, I talk about um, the development of behavior in many cases. Some animals are born with what we might call innate any predator responses in the sense that um, they respond appropriately without any prior experience to various predatory stimuli. And I talk about olfactory and visual and, and acoustic things that, that, that fulfill that. Um, but that doesn't mean that animals can't learn and improve their any predator responses. And there's a lot of examples of that as well. More importantly, when we think about life history trajectories in different species, some species live fast and die young and other species are in it for the long haul. And it turns out that if you're raised in a predator-rich environment, that's probably predicting that you're going to be around predators your whole life. And in some cases, that shifts species to living faster life history trajectories, meaning that they're going to live fast and die young. So early experiences with predators or predatory stimuli actually can change the whole way that animals um, structure energy allocation. They may reproduce earlier because they're not expected to live as long, etc. And that's fascinating. So early fears can really screw you up or change you. Maybe it's adaptive in some circumstances. You know, it's controversial, but people see the same sorts of things potentially in humans. Humans um, growing up in really challenging environments, um, you know, have lifelong consequences and effects from growing up in really challenging environments. And many of these shift life history decisions and shift a life history trajectory towards reproducing earlier, um, et cetera, and not putting as much energy into, you know, defense, immunological defense and potentially put it into other defenses. So we see, you know, chronic poverty sort of persisting in part because of epigenetic potentially effects of early life experiences. And it's, it's horrible. I mean, it's really hard to break that, those sorts of cycles. Mm -hmm. We can see it in, 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 we can see it experimentally in other animals. Um, if you walk a dog by snowshoe hares that are in a cage, um, they, the mothers change their behavior. They change their resource allocation to their, um, to their, to their babies. Um, and their baby's life history trajectories are altered as well. Um, because of the predatory threats that the mother was experiencing. Right. I think a lot about this and the impacts of the, let's say, initial fear and response and then the after effects, like the cost at the time. And then you have a chapter called Cascading Effects. I think about the after effects of that. So let's say an organism has a strong fear response and it takes a lot of energy what are the general effects like a, a day later? Is it weaker? What is co the cost there? Yeah, you know, it sort of depends. So um, escaping something once, um, aside from potentially learning that that might be a risky situation um, and maybe avoiding a particular habitat if, if the predators are you know, in a particular habitat, that could make it harder to get resources. Um, one escape, if it's you know a lower risk escape, might not be that costly. Chronic stress, as Robert Sapolsky and others have shown us, you know, is very, it's very, is very, is very costly. Um, but but intermittent stress, maybe not so. 
um, because the system adapts. I mean, it, it, there, there is a pulse of glucocorticoids and other chemicals, but then you know the system resets. Um, so it really depends on the nature of those experiences. Having said that, um, we can humans sometimes get post-traumatic stress disorder in you know bad situations, and animals have one trial predator learning as well um, that changes their outlook on life um, you know consistently. Um, colleagues of mine here uh, use animal models, rats, and they say we're not using animal models as models of PTSD, we're giving rats PTSD, um, which is kind of mean at some level. <laughs> but they're then, you know, coming up with really innovative ways to think about how can we pharmacologically intervene and prevent memory consolidation and PTSD formation. I mean, PTSD is debilitating for people in wars, people experiencing other traumas. Um, and, you know, I think there's some interesting ethical discussions you can have about this, but, uh, you know, it's probably good not to sort of figure out ways for people not to have PTSD. Um, not to not be fearful, but not to have, you know, true post-traumatic stress disorder. So animals get PTSD and animals can learn with just one trial um, to have lifelong effects of one, one, you know, one particularly bad experience. Mm -hmm. I like that you mentioned Robert Sapolsky there. I once uh, interviewed him. I wrote, I read his book, Behave. And that was very informative in the category. And normally I would ask this later, but in relation, are there any scientists that have work that has been some of the basis for your work that come to mind? Well, there are a lot of people. So, I mean, I sort of dedicate this book to my students and colleagues from whom I've learned so much. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, in, in terms of book authors, I mean, Sapolsky's work's been, you know, fabulous. A, a guy named Joseph Ledoux has, talked about um, stress and anxiety and fear um, throughout his career and does really interesting neuroscience. I'm not a neuroscientist, you know, I'm not the one to talk to about neuroscience, but I mean, I, I followed his work for, for many years. He, interestingly now, he sort of says only humans can have fear and we can't say that non-humans have fear. I disagree with that um, for a variety of reasons. Um, maybe other emotions. I mean, clearly every species is unique Humans are unique in a variety of ways. One way that we're um, unique is I don't think any other species has, you know, Sean and Freud, right? You know, um, <laughs> I think other species have fear and I think we can study fear. Um, I think fear is accessible, it's adaptive, and, you know, we are the descendants of our ancestors, not just our human ancestors and hominid ancestors, but all of our animal ancestors that successfully managed risk and threats and got these trade-offs right and all of them were fearful so fear is something where the neural circuits the neurochemistry um you know all is pretty conserved um through a lot of vertebrates at least and i think that it, it's it's appropriate to say this emotion is something we share with others yes that's an important point i like that by the way that we're connected to the past i posted that recently that we're connected our uh, responses from worms hundreds of millions of years ago, their uh, nervous system. I thought that was interesting. And I would think that if we have the same base pathways and then we have a certain response and let's say uh, an animal has a certain response, what is the likelihood that any of these things are not the same exact thing? Like it looks like it and then underneath it, we study and we see the same processes. How, how possible is it that it could have the same everything but not feel fear? Well, I mean, I don't know what you feel. So, I mean, you know, um, you know, hardcore uh, uh, right. philosophers say I can only know about my own internal world. I mean, maybe we're all living in the matrix, um, but I can't really attribute, uh, you know, what I'm feeling to someone else. I think that's a little silly at some levels. Um, it's worth arguing, but I think it's kind of silly at some levels. Uh, I think anyone that has a dog knows that, you know, there are emotions of, of joy and happiness and sadness that you know, your dog has in certain right. situations. Um, everything we see in non-humans is not simply, you know, the result of stimulus and responses and only humans have forethought and, and, and you know, retrospective thinking, et cetera. Other animals can anticipate things. Other animals can, you know, mull over experiences and as they should. Um, I'm not asserting, and I don't want to assert that 
we feel things the same way that other animals do, but I think there's enough, for fear at least, um, enough uh, similar processes, parts of the brain and, 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 and circuits and chemicals involved um, that probably make it pretty similar. Hmm. Having said that, we can add other sorts of things to it. I don't know how much social anxiety that other species have. They may have some. I mean, if you're a subordinate hyena, um, for example, um, you probably should have social anxiety. Um, but if, if um, you know, we see things in, in different ways, there, for example, you know, is the this, is, is this social fear we might have or the fear of public speaking we might have the same fear as any predator fear? And I would say that there are components of this of the brain and the body that are involved in any predator fear when we might be afraid of public speaking um, or experience social anxiety. But there's other systems on top of that that may interact with that as well. And uh, is that unique in humans? Well, maybe. Uh, maybe we should look at other highly social species and maybe we, we find similar sorts of systems in other highly social species as well. Does this mean that I can understand how another animal really feels? Maybe, maybe for more closely related species, um, maybe not for others. Uh, it sort of depends on the emotion and I think it depends on you know the context. But for fear, I think it's much easier to be able to infer similar sorts of, 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 of feelings. Is an animal mulling over for, for weeks, um, you know, a bad experience that they've had? Uh, the way I sort of mulled over for days and weeks, you know, the, following my attack in Kenya, um, I don't know. Um, but they certainly change their behavior as I change my behavior. Um, so is that a sign of constant mulling and reflection? I don't know. I don't know how other species really feel when they reflect. I think we can anthropomorphize, which is over attribute our emotions to non-humans, but we can also um, sort of do the reverse. Um, Franz Zaval talked about anthropodenialism, and I think we have to be a little careful of that as well. Mm -hmm. We don't want to over attribute or under attribute. Yeah. One thing that comes to mind is fear is constantly adjusted, right? If there's a lot of um, impact on you, then your response flight or fight or flight response goes up. And then if not, then it's not there. Uh, does that make organisms that don't have as much interaction with that system because things are calmer for a longer period of time, does that make them more vulnerable in the longer term or is that not really a thing? Don't know. Um, it's a really interesting question and it's a question that sort of undermines a lot of my urban ecology work and urban behavioral biology work. So what's fascinating about cities is that um, sometimes cities have fewer predators Sometimes they might have more or different predators, but um, if you put a hiking trail in or there are lots of people, animals that are can become tolerant to people may not en end up fearing people. And it's really an empirical question about whether that reduction in fear to people translates to other predators or not. But it's really important to know. So, I mean, I've written books on ecotourism. I'm an avid ecotourist. Um, I like going out and seeing things. But ecotourism is a huge industry that clearly affects non-humans. We stress animals out in the wild. Um, sometimes they habituate to us. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? So if you're a mountain gorilla in Rwanda, it may be a bad thing if that makes you more vulnerable to poachers because they've habituated to people. If you're, oh, I forget the name of the species of monkey in Southern Africa, uh, it might be a bad thing because actually when the animals habituated to people, they were less wary about real predators as well. But I'm not sure how widespread that is. I think it happens, and I think we have to understand when that happens. But it would be sort of silly because that sort of says that they're perceiving us as the same type of predator as, as a wolf or a leopard, for example. Mm -hmm. And we know that species are really good at distinguishing among different sorts of predators and uh, having unique responses to those different sorts of predators. So if by habituating to us, a species then transfers that habituation to another species. In some sense, that's a tool that developmental psychologists use to study um, how pre-verbal kids um, sort of see the world. 
you habituate them to something and then you see if they transfer it or not. And if they transfer that habituation, then you say, well, they're perceiving that in the same category. So it would be surprising if wolves and um, humans are treated in the same category or not, but it really depends on the species. And I think it's a question that we need to study more and more. And one that fascinates me. It sure is interesting because does this transfer to that? One thing that came to mind there when you said scale, I noticed that in your, I like, your website is very organized. I like, it. it's very informative. And you, you described the scale uh, in relation to in, in fear, but it made me think of a uh, scale in relation to Jeffrey West's book, Scale, which was about cities and their scaling laws. And uh, when I spoke to him, it was just mostly about cities and some organisms. It made me think, is there any scaling laws with relation to fear, such as like how many times fear has to happen before it becomes a chronic stressor versus just a passing moment? Is there any like physical laws that come to mind? Yeah, you know, I, I sort of don't know. It's a really good question. Um, I mean, West's work is really fascinating and, and scaling is really fascinating. One of the things we're doing in our lab now is, is thinking a lot about scaling processes in cities and how scaling, it, when you start looking at urbanization, it's not just the scaling of the built infrastructure, it's the scaling of the biodiversity, it's the scaling of evolutionary effects. And one reason that scaling is really interesting is because if you want to manage biodiversity in urban areas, can you learn from small cities what to do in mega cities? If all of these processes scale isometrically, yeah. If some scale super linearly and sub some linearly, maybe not. So you really need to understand biodiversity scaling in urban areas, along with infrastructure scaling in urban areas, along with socio-cultural process scaling in urban areas in order to properly manage biodiversity in urban areas. So that's a big project that colleagues and I are involved in now, which is fascinating. And West's work on scaling is, is spot on. I haven't thought about um, the nature of, except with respect to whether, so we know that sometimes animals habituate to repeat challenges, benign threats, um, people, right? But mm -hmm. sometimes they sensitize to people. And so what that basically is showing that there could be, with repeated exposure to people, um, some species become more tolerant and some species become less tolerant. And that's really interesting. And I don't think we have good theory to explain that distinction between um, why some species may habituate and some may sensitize. Uh, people study sensitization processes, people study habituation processes. Habituation has been studied by psychologists for well over a hundred years in, in, in the lab, but we don't really under, have a, a really good natural history of that. We don't really have a good evolutionary understanding of that. These are processes that are adaptive processes that um, are useful. I've got some hypotheses about, you know, why with, you know, birds may become more flighty in some areas with more people and less flighty and more tolerant in other areas with more people. But we, we really need to test these ideas and develop better theory. And at some level, that's about scaling of human interactions. So that's the way I've been thinking about this a little, but I think there's a lot of room for other sorts of questions about scaling as, as well with respect to any predator behavior. Hmm. I find that interesting because that makes sense. Sometimes you're holding back from what that thing is. And then in the other end is you're adapting to what that thing is. And uh, there's a give and take there as far as do you keep that thing as part of your world or is it external? You mentioned that the biodiversity there in general across our planet. Is biodiversity going down? Is that a thing that is included or is it? Yeah, it's really depressing. Um, so it's, I mean, we're in um, the Anthropocene, which is uh, really a, a geological epic and a million years, you'll be able to come back and say, really, the Plasticine, but we're in the Anthropocene. You'll be able to see in the fossil record, in, you know, you dig down that we've really screwed up things in the world right now. We're also driving the sixth mass extinction event. Mass extinction events are where a large proportion of species on Earth go extinct. Um, we haven't had lots of extinctions yet, um, but if 
you look at the trends of many populations of vertebrates and other species, uh, all the trends are pretty poor. Uh, a colleague of mine in Mexico City, Gerardo Savalas, um, writes paper, these really good papers every couple of years that just get me more and more depressed. So he's like, we're not extinct, you know, we're not seeing the extinctions, but we're seeing massive declines in vertebrate populations around the world. And, you know, you have fewer of something, it's the system's less resilient to, to change. Why are we seeing these extinctions? I mean, it's sort of the multiple horses of the apocalypse. It's, you know, we're using too many resources, we're destroying so much habitat, we're polluting the environment, we're, we're putting toxins, the toxification of earth cannot be underestimated. Um, sperm counts are going down in humans and non-humans because of chemical pollution that has permeated the whole globe. Um, we're harvesting species to extinction. Every commercial fishery that we've pretty much set our eyes on eventually goes commercially extinct, which means it's too hard to, it's not economically viable to keep fishing for those species, unless you have slavery, and then unless you have childhood slavery. So it turns out that um, in West Africa, um, where people have been overfishing uh, near shore resources for a while, uh, it, it just it wasn't worth hiring people to go out on fishing boats. So then the fishing boat owners would buy slaves. And then it wasn't cost effective to buy adult slaves. So they bought childhood, they bought kids to be slaves on the fishing boats. And that is sort of this nasty, horrible socio-biodiversity vortex um, where, you know, markets drive markets. And in this case, a decline in fisheries really drove a market in slavery and eventually childhood slavery. So fixing biodiversity is good for many reasons, but it also, in some cases, might eliminate a need or a demand for really low income um, people to work to harvest, try to harvest the last of you know, anything out there. Um, there's a real tight nexus between um, animals and plants and organisms on Earth keeping us healthy and how we interact with them in, in various ways as well. Um, and I think there, there's one good example. But many things, I mean, well, everything hasn't gone extinct yet, we are losing species left and right. And it's sad. It is a bit, a little bit, but also at the same time, we see what we currently have. One thing I like about research is that it allows you to see things. I like bigger picture concepts. And so most of the public world is not bigger picture material, but <laughs> another, another reaction uh, is not. And it's very uh, super small, we'll call it. And then in rare instances, when a breadth of research is done, then you can start to see, oh, this led to this. There's effects that go beyond this to that. And a year later and five years later, I like that concept. Uh, well, but systems thinking is the way to think about all of our problems, whether it's COVID, which we can talk about in a moment, <laughs> or it's biodiversity extinction, or it's, it's, it's global security. You have to think about, um, you know, the, the world as a complex system. And um, complex systems have, among the scaling principles associated with them, but, um, you know, non-linearities are expected. You do a little tweak here, and then something big or small happens later later on. It's, it's, it's much more difficult to think about causality. And when you're dealing with problems, um, biocultural problems, um, there's not one easy fix. Um, you have to sort of address lots of things and you have to really think about how you fix those things. So COVID, for example, is you know, a complex problem. It's actually quite simple. Um, you know, the Americans, I'm going to be jingoistic here. Um, we wrote the book on dealing with pandemics. We funded the research. We have this wonderful CDC. Um, we donated to the WHO and participated in the WHO. And of course, the WHO is political. Everything in the UN is political. Everything in the world is political. <laughs> but we work with them. We've worked with the world to help suppress pandemics in the past. And we threw out the playbook and you know, aren't even using a playbook right now. And it's responsible not only for our deaths, we've earned that one, 
but it's responsible, I think, for the deaths of people around the world. And that's not acceptable to me. Um, and, you know, why would anyone want to politicize mask wearing? You know, why would anyone want to politicize keeping older people alive or keeping vulnerable people alive? Well, we're a very um, inwardly independent, individualistic society. I mean, we're one of the most individualistic societies out there. That is this huge ecological trap that we're all falling in right now. Um, and it's horrible. It's horrible um, at, at many levels. Having said that, um, you know, there, I think there are lessons from any predator behavior and lessons from, you know, getting these ideas from this book I've written uh, to, that apply to pandemics. First of all, individuals face different risks. A young, a young human, my students, my undergraduates, on average, have a lower probability of having a bad outcome than I have. I'm in my mid fifties. They're in their you know late teens or early twenties. Um, they get sick. Most of them will probably be okay. Um, I get sick. I'll probably be okay too. I mean, you know, the mortality rate isn't that high, right. um, but you know, there's a, a higher probability that I'm going to have a bad outcome um, or a bad uh, uh, side effects or whatever. So risk is context specific and individual specific, and individuals should be basing their trade offs from an individual perspective based on the risk they're experiencing. Public health officials know this. You know, they know they have to have different targeted messages to young people than old people. My parents, you know, who I would like to be safe, um, you know, were going out and shopping when we didn't really know much about this thing. I'm like, why are you going out shopping? I want to go out and shopping. Why are you going out to a restaurant? I want to go out to a restaurant. You know, they're near the end of their lives. Maybe they have nothing to lose. Um, except I'm locking myself in, you know, I'm not even, I'm, I live on a different coast than they do. I'm locking myself in to save their lives and they're going out and taking risks. Again, it's an individual, you know, trade-off. And I think we need to, and we do, but we need to do a better job, market our messages and recognize that individuals will face, will, will have different sort of optimal solutions. And really to me, it's about creating a collectivistic culture right now um, where we're all in this together we could get rid of this thing. I don't know if we could ever get rid of this thing in the US, um, but I work in Australia, or I used to work in Australia. Um, can't get there now. Um, you know, they've more or less eliminated it. I was just Zooming a colleague yesterday and her kids, in day, her kids are in daycare and she goes out and does things and you know, schools in sessions and there's very, very little COVID and they're managing it. And they have targeted shutdowns and, and things like that. The, the state of Western Australia, which is half a continent, I mean, they closed their borders, but um, there's no COVID there. I mean, you know, I, 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 they, they, they live their normal lives. So you can, if you want to, work together to, to, get, to get this thing. But if you allow people to sort of take their individual selfish tendencies, maybe, maybe not so. You know, the early response to COVID in March was not exactly fitting to the moment. The fear was like 10 times what it was. And then later on now, when there's way more spread than there was, and the fear should probably be higher proportionally in some way, it's dropped off. So, I mean, you know, we habituate to, to I mean, most of us haven't gotten sick. Right. I mean, all of us can, but most mm -hmm. of us haven't. And, you know, you can only have sustained vigilance for so long. I mean, it's costly. Um, there are huge social costs. Um, I am devastated that we can't figure out a way that we choose not to open schools in, in many places in the U.S. I mean, I think if we had, um, you know, a good social safety net, um, and if we had allowed people, if they were sick, paid them to not go to work, and that, that we could, you know, reduce the, 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 the likelihood that sick people would be coming to work. Um, but at the end of the day, close down the bars and restaurants, pay the owners, pay the people that work there, pay the real estate, you know, tycoons, but close them down and prioritize getting K through 12ers in school, particularly K through eights. Um, I think we're causing a generation of, of problems from this. I mean, kids are resilient, but this is leading to all sorts of problems. And as 
is exacerbating inequities uh, that were already there. Um, because if people are from wealthy backgrounds, they probably are doing better than people in poor backgrounds in terms of catching up or keeping up with um, education. And again, kids are resilient, but this is hurting. It's hurting, it's hurting in terms of socialization. It's hurting in terms of being able to do things. These are decisions we're making. Um, however, COVID fatigue is a real thing. We are social animals. We are obligately social. It really hurts. I mean, Zoom is only so good. Um, it really hurts not to get together with people and see people and break the bread with people. I mean, my wife and I, is, our main form of, uh, you know, uh, entertainment is having dinner parties and going to friends' dinner parties and hanging out. And, um, you know, we're, really, we're not doing that. Um, we Zoom people and have Zoom tales, but, you know, it's not as though we're breaking the bread in the ways we used to. I don't know when we're going to have a dinner party again, honestly. Um, you know, I, I would have one in Australia if I got to Australia and they let me in and I was safe there. I would have one easily there. Right. I don't know when I'm going to have one here. Um, there's just way too much COVID and there's too many, too few people that, you know, want to get immunized. Um, this is a collective thing. We can get our economy back if we take a collective approach and work together. But our individualistic tendencies, our, our individualistic risk assessments are all very different. And these are adaptive processes, but it's not working at the state level. And it's certainly not working at um, getting together to solve something that we can that we can work together to solve, but we choose not to in the U.S. This is true. Speaking of COVID and dinner parties, you reminded me of right before COVID hit in like early March, I think I was in New York for the first time and I had a dinner party with Dr. Azra Raza, who's a cancer researcher and a group of people. And I made great connections there, which you can't do as much over the internet. It's not the same. And then continue to, to speak with the various individuals across the whole year. And that's something that we would like to get back to. And it will be good when that occurs because it's something nice about being around people and absorbing the energy. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, so um, I, I wrote a book called Eating Our Way to Civility, a dinner party guide. And, you know, breaking the bread with people is really important. And sitting down with people who have different beliefs and backgrounds and respecting other people's beliefs is really important. And you can easily do that over dinner parties. You know, you don't like where the conversation's going, bring in a new course, pour another round of drinks, change the subject. But, you know, hanging out with people who might have different beliefs than you is really important. And we are so polarized right now. Um, it's just this, you know, giant vortex to the bottom. Um, and it goes both ways. I just read one, a, a Van Jones book he wrote a couple of years ago, and it was really good um, because, you know, he sort of called it as well. Um, he went after the Democrats and he went after the Republicans and he said, we got to get together and here's ways we can get together. And here's things we can agree to work together to solve. And he was spot on. I talked with Peter Coleman at Columbia University about his book, which was just completely about polarization and how it's just on the up. One thing that just came back to my mind earlier, you had mentioned non-linearities of growth. I wanted to go back to, this was a key point that I did not want to leave out non-linearities in sound as far as how they arouse fear. Can you speak a bit about that? Because I think about that sometimes for the songs that have a little bit more of like an undertone, ominous undertone. And what is that? And you yeah, so I have chapters on loosely on the sound of fear, the sight of fear, and the smell of fear. Um, and look at a lot of anti-predator behavior there. The sound of fear was a story that started when I was holding a baby marmot. So I, I run this project in Colorado. We've just finished our 59th year of studying marmots. I'm not even 59. Um, and, um, you know, we... Um, study them throughout their lives. I don't hurt these animals. I've looked at eight of the 15 species of marmots that live around the Northern Hemisphere, the, the world. Um, and I was just holding this baby marmot and it screamed in my hands and I almost dropped it. And I'm like, wow, um, why am I having an emotional response to a scream of a baby rodent? I hear them alarm call all the time, these chirping like calls, they alarm call from the first day they're out. That was the first time I heard a scream. And that sort of got me thinking about screams. So then we started recording screams and it was hard to get a good data set of the recording of the screams. It turns out that when you look at screams, they're not structured like alarm calls at all. Um, they look kind of noisy. What's noise? Well, think about your stereo in your car. You turn it up a little, it gets louder, turn it up a little more, it gets louder, turn it up, it sounds really good. And then at some point it sort of breaks down 
and it starts getting distorted. So it turns out that nonlinear systems have a phase where input equals output, you know, times x, and then it becomes predictably unpredictable beyond some point. It becomes chaotic. So this predictable un unpredictability essentially is the system is in sort of its nonlinear state space. So acoustically, we hear that when we turn up our stereo. Um, for a mammal that is blowing air across its vocal folds and vocal cords to produce sound, um, if you blow air too fast, it creates nonlinearities. So when animals are scared, they might be blowing too much air out over their vocal cords and vocal folds and creating what sound like and look like on images of sounds, um, nonlinear what are called vocal attributes. Um, noisy sorts of sounds are one of those things. Rapid frequency changes, rapid amplitude changes, um, um, rapid pitch changes, rapid frequency change. All of these are, are, are nonlinear attributes. Some other things called biphonation and subharmonics um, are, non are, are the product of a nonlinear system in sort of this nonlinear space. Um, so we can hear those. So I was giving a talk at, at UCLA a while ago, and I wondered whether uh, allowed, you know, I, I said, I bet this works in, you know, music and soundtracks. And a guy comes up to me and introduces himself, says, yeah, I'm sort of a film score composer and musician, and I'm working on a PhD thinking about biological models of emotion. And I think you're right. I'm like, hey, let's collaborate. So we ended up collaborating on a couple projects. And um, the first one we did was we looked at, um, movie soundtracks. And um, a movie soundtrack is really complex. It's not, you know, a vocal production system. It involves instruments and different instruments of so music. It involves spoken word and singing word and screams and non-vocal sounds. It involves diagenic or background sounds. It involves um, Foley or, you know, sound effects. Um, so that's not a system in any natural way. But we said, if this were, if these sounds were the product of a system, can we look at voice prints, audio spectrograms, and can we find evidence of what might be a nonlinearity in, um, if this were the product of a normal, you know, system? So it took us a long time to agree to how on how to score these things. And what we did was we looked at horror films, we looked at um, sad dramatic films, we looked at um, funny films, we looked at um, uh, war films, adventure films, and we looked at the sort of the key moments in those films and we sort of took out like a 10 second clip and said, okay, can we find evidence of nonlinearities? We had hypotheses that in, you know, certainly in the horror films we would find them and maybe in the adventure films we would, wouldn't find them in the other films, the other scenes. So, um, you know, Janet Leigh screaming in Psycho. Um, is a great example of this. There's the music, do, 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 do. you know, there's the, there's her screaming. Her first scream was a real scream. I mean, she screamed. The following screams were sort of actor screams, but the oh. first one was a real scream. She was overblowing her vocal, you know, system and you can see it and you can hear it. And it sounds different. It captures our attention. So, you know, what we found was that, that horror films, <laughs> unsurprisingly, have more female screams than, than, than you would expect by chance and, and more noisy sounds as well in them. Um, sad dramatic films have fewer um, noisy sounds that, that would be expected by chance. So um, film score composers and musicians don't really know this, but they've intuitively understood it. They have their inner marmot working in their mind telling them how to compose their music and you know do these soundtracks and their inner marmot is saying noise matters and noise is evocative and noise captures your attention um, so we then you know, we then made our own movies and, and and looked at sounds and made our own sounds our marmot inspired music and found that that really is the the noise that is particularly evocative in these in the in these things which is which is kind of cool I like the concept that items from tens, hundreds, millions of years ago, thousands, they are built into us. And then we go to an entertaining show and it's entertaining because it's hitting certain biochemical pathways or fear, same thing. And it's almost like 
we were just triggering what applied for staying alive maybe at some point long ago uh, for our entertainment feeling or emotional change or whatever in today's I mean, you know our, our cognitive abilities are evolved they're adaptive and um, the challenge we face is we're not in the environment in which we evolved so social media is horrible actually um, you know it, it taps into our worst inner you know primate our, our worst inner chimpanzee it just pulls it out of us um, and you know we we we, we get all these dopamine fixes from having likes and I mean, I'm, I, I do as little social media, social media as I can, which is ironic given that I'm on a podcast, but that's not social media in the same way. No. It's a long form way of communicating and reaching out yes. to people, which is a good thing. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, this, this stuff's killing us and it's breaking us apart and we're not evolved to resist this. And the, the people who design this stuff know it. They don't let their kids use it, um, <laughs> right? They don't, they're smart. <laughs> They know that they've weaponized something to make money personally, and they, the, 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 the titans of the tech industry do not let their kids use the technology that they're selling to everyone else because it's not really good for you, and it doesn't really make you happier. Um, you know, looking at Instagram uh, filtered people in their best moment as though this is life is just not reality. That's just not life. That's not what people look like. Um, but I mean, it's, 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 it's the same thing. So these mismatches can cause, can cause problems. Nonetheless, we need to understand the conditions under which we evolved to potentially understand how to manage those sorts of mismatches. So for example, we typically overestimate risk as we should. Um, and, and colleagues we over, and I- We overestimate. We overestimate and that's adaptive. So some people um, view there's a whole list of cognitive biases. There's this wonderful thing called the cognitive bias codex. I said um, this. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's brilliant psychom. It's, it's just so cool, yes. right? But it's all these biases that psychologists have come up with. There were so um, many. So many. Um, and I, you know, I, I go into it and I learn things every time I look at it. Um, so at the end of the day, a number of these that I've you know, thought about and the colleagues have thought about really makes sense. We overestimate, um, you know, bad things happening to us. We undervalue good things happening to us. So we're really pissed off when someone takes $10 away from us, but they, if they increase our salary by 10 bucks, we're, we're not as happy as we're pissed off that someone reduced our salary by 10 bucks, right? Mm -hmm. So um, these are biases that are probably have been very protective in evolutionary history for organisms that have those biases. Turns out that a lot of organisms slightly overestimate risk. So you could say that's an error. And when people think about these cognitive biases, they think these are things that are leading to erroneous um, behaviors, that people are making errors. But if you sort of say, well, if you ask the question, could they not be an error? Could they actually be an adaptation? You get a, a different answer. And the answer is for some of these that I've looked at and colleagues have looked at, they make a lot of sense. The fundamental attribution error. Um, if I fail at something, I um, blame the contextual processes. I lost my job because of COVID. But if some outgroup person fails at something, they lost their job because they're lazy, right? We just tap into that shit, um, right? We just, we just eat that up. Well, it probably makes us safe because if there are threats coming from outsiders, if there are threats coming, in, coming from others, it prevents us from being exploited. So a slight bias this way um, may make sense. And it makes sense for whatever species you know, share these things. In-group, out-group discrimination, um, neighbor stranger recognition. Um, every Many, many, many species, this has been looked in, it's pretty ubiquitous in lots of species. You know who your neighbors are, you know if someone's not your neighbor. Why? You learn your neighbor because you have a different relationship with them than a true stranger. So these in-group, out-group biases that we see in many species, um, including humans, probably kept us safe um, for a variety of reasons. That's not to institutionalize racism. That's not to say here's a biological reason why we should be racist. I do not ever want to be accused of engaging in 
you know, the naturalistic fallacy. Just because it is means it should be. I disagree with that. But this is to say that this is what we have to go against if we want to live in a world that tries to eliminate racism and biases against certain people or positions. So nonetheless, these biases probably make sense. And you can see overestimating risk as something that, that plays well, which is why, as I talk about in the book and talk about in other things I'm writing, you know, don't trust a politician who says, only I can make you safe. Um, you know, first of all, there is no thing as safety. There's things as managing risks and threats. You know, vote for me, I'm gonna get rid of COVID. No, I'm gonna work with you to, you know, try to reduce the risks of COVID. Um, you can't eliminate all threats. Maybe we can eliminate COVID in some places. Maybe we can eliminate COVID globally um, if we really want to do that. But you know, it takes a, it, it's going to take a bit of work. But at the end of the day, um, there's no such thing as pure safety. The other thing that behavioral ecology tells us is that you can be purely safe. If you're a marmot, you can stay in your burrow your whole life, but you're going to starve to death. So animals have to trade off the safety of being in a truly safe place versus going outside and exposing themselves to risks. And that plays well for our lives as well. We have to trade off risks and rewards. The trade-offs and the set points on those trade-offs might be different for each one of us based on assessments of the risks, um, opportunity costs and other things that, that go on, which are things I study you know, on a daily basis with, with non-human species and see other animals making adaptive-ish trade-offs all the time. But you know, we have to face these trade-offs and we should recognize that we're all gonna be facing trade-offs and we should recognize that we're all gonna be um, living with risk in some way, shape or form. So politicians can't, don't listen to politicians that assure you know, safety if only we close our borders or do this, but rather um, you know, we, we need to, to manage risks and threats. The other thing is that um, our flight or flight system is designed to be a fast twitch system in some sense. So um, Kahneman and Tversky wrote in Thinking Fast and Thinking Slow, you know, that we have two cognitive systems. Daniel Kahneman? In, yeah, uh -huh. um, in which we, um, you know, evaluate things. Our fast system and fight or flight responses should be a fast system and a more reflective system. And, and one way you can respond to politicians who rile us up with, with fear, because it always works, mm -hmm. um, is to just slow it down and to say, well, what, are, what, what is the evidence that that's true? And, you know, what is, is that true? And, you know, is this a real risk? And what if we do things slightly differently? So being more reflective when we want, when we're being pushed, you know, you should be fearful right now, being more reflective can also, can often recast the problem and then it's sort of solved by our slow twitch system, if you will. Um, and, and, and that's one way of managing um, uh, threats and, and, and making maybe better decisions. Mm -hmm. As you mentioned, risk mitigation it made me think of, you have your minimizing costs chapter, and then I once talked with the economist who they think this way as well. She said her whole job was about risk mitigation and like gave an example of a brothel where the whole point of the brothel was risk mitigation in relation to, uh, you know, physical uh, intimacy in Nevada and yeah so we and then so if a politician alludes to just uh, providing some sort of stabilized force it's not really in their hands to do that in as one person well but I mean risk mitigation is really interesting because we see in humans at least um, and potentially other animals there are all sorts of compensatory behaviors and the question is you know is everyone sort of modifying their behavior so they're really facing the same risk. So when, when any lock brakes were first invented, they were tested in, I think, Munich taxi drivers. Um, so it rains in Munich and you get icy roads, Munich or Zurich. And, um, and basically it didn't reduce the accident rate at all because taxi drivers realized they could drive faster because the brakes kept them faster. Um, ski equipment, is much better than it ever used to be. Almost everyone skis with a helmet now. Um, the equipment's better, you can turn better and faster and stop more easily. Um, fatalities haven't gone down at all because people should ski faster and, and accept that risk. So you could imagine, you know, and what we're hearing now is 
People get COVID tested and say, I'm fine, now let's go out and party. Well, maybe not, um, right? So um, policymakers need to understand risk mitigation in order to come up with bespoke messages and policies that sort of work and, and recognize that we might always be pushing our personal limits and we might all have different personal limits. And we might all be pushing our personal limits to, 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 to sort of really not change the risk at all in some sense. I like that you bring up that it made me think of something I came up with a long time ago about snowboarding. For example, it's sort of similar, but I always said you can't really get hit because if you, let's say you fall on the path, if someone's going slow, they'll hit you softly, you're fine. If they're going medium, they're probably a little bit better. And uh, if you get hit, it'll be a soft hit, not too hard, but they probably avoid you. And if they're a pro and they're going super fast, they'll probably have the ability to avoid you. You can't get hit. That was one of my themes on the snowboarding path. Kind of funny. I get hit by snowboarders regularly, so yeah. you know, gotta be careful skiing snowboarders around. The other item um, you had mentioned the biases I wanted to go back to because I was thinking, let's say someone, when I see those biases, a lot of them I've like countered them. I, I don't know if I'm using my prefrontal cortex to I've built in counters, but like a lot of them don't apply to me. And I was wondering, uh, is that like, are biases counterable? Like you can adjust yourself so that later on that doesn't hit you that way? I don't know. I, I think, I think again, by, I think if, if, if a, a bias is a cognitive ability that evolved and maybe was adaptive in some situation, but maybe is not adaptive in other situations, um, then, you know, you can certainly go against your biological desires, if so to speak. Um, and I think um, it's okay for society to say we should not necessarily, you know, um, be our inner chimpanzee. And maybe we, we should be our inner, inner, you know, bonobo more than we should be our inner chimpanzee. So I think that, you know, we, the only way big groups of people really can work together is to have rules to follow and everyone can't be doing their own thing. And I think, unfortunately, that's what we're seeing in the U.S. now um, with a lot of COVID responses, um, that people want to do their own thing. But that just doesn't work in a, in a bigger society. So there might be a, a bias um, that might lead to something. You can overrule your bias. You should not, you know, you are not, um, uh, while we are the product of our genes and our experience, um, you know, it's not as though there's something running in your head that says you have to do it this way. I mean, you can learn, you can change your behavior. We do it all the time. My industry is about changing the structure of people's brains. Um, you know, <laughs> if you read my book, uh, hopefully the structure of your brain will be changed. You will know different things than you did going into it. How cool is that? That's super cool. I can vouch for the people that are <laughs> thinking that they would think it was super cool too, because that's like alteration. That means we're not fixed, rigid forms that have no variety to us. I think that's, that's way cooler. One, I want to include two things. One, what are current, uh, what is one or a category of current projects you are working on with students? And then separate from that, what is a message you would want all people to know about the nature of fear if you had like a megaphone to all people? Yeah, so I mean, I'm doing a lot of things with students um, and colleagues from all over the place. Um, one project that I'm really excited about is work we're doing in Australia, um, where we're trying to um, so Australian mammals are problematic. Uh, Europeans introduced cats and red foxes to Australia when, you know, about 200 or so years ago, and that led to an extinction cascade. So if you want to look at mammalian extinctions, not just redu redu reduced populations, you know, depending upon how you're counting, 27 mammals have gone extinct since European colonization, largely because of introduced cats and foxes. Um, you have a continent of animals that are incredibly vulnerable to cats and foxes. Some species survived on offshore islands but have gone extinct in the mainland Australia. So there's a lot of desire, and, and many of these animals in Australia live nowhere else. They're endemic. So I believe in endemism. I believe that it's worth trying to save these species and restore um, the Australian mainland to maybe something that it was like before we got there. Um, and um, colleagues and I are um, working to try to basically naturally inculcate fear in species by letting them live with low densities of predators. So we're working with cats 
And um, we found that when you put a bunch of, these are burrowing betongs and greater bilbies in with low densities of cats in really large reserves, large fenced areas, I'm talking, you know, 23, 26 square kilometer Whoa. fenced areas. Huge. Huge. Hundreds of, hundreds of bilbies and betongs couple cats, maybe a couple more cats, maybe up to 10 cats, maybe up to 15 cats. You can have them living with cats. You can have them coexisting with cats in densities that um, they're sort of extinct outside the fence um, around with. And we have changed the behavior of these animals. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to select or allow these animals to learn to make better bilbies, make better bedongs that are cat tolerant individuals. And then we're experimenting by translocating them into places with cats and we have controlled populations that we have not li have let live with cats. And for the bilbies, we found that the bilbies living with cats survive longer than the bilbies without cats. So it works. Bedongs, we haven't found that yet, which is interesting. And we have some reasons for that and we're experimenting with those as well. But ultimately we're trying to come up with novel ways to allow animals to regain fears that they might have lost when living on offshore islands and trying to use that for conservation successes. Um, and I think that's really cool stuff. Um, and it's challenging and it's exciting and we're learning a lot doing it. Um, I'm doing a lot of things with marmots and other animals, um, but I'm also um, doing a lot of urbanization work. I have a number of students in my lab and postdocs in my lab now working in sort of broadly the field of urban ecology because I think it's really fascinating. Most people live in cities now. Um, you know, if we can get our biodiversity conservation in cities right, it's good for us because living around animals and seeing animals um, and, and biodiversity in general makes us happier and healthier. Um, and it's good for um, the species as well. So we're doing a lot of work in that that's exciting. In terms of one message from um, the fear book, I think that fear is natural. It's made us who we are. Um, you don't want to be anxious about being anxious, but anxiety and fear are good things. And there are lessons from life that uh, allow us to manage these risks uh, wisely. And this is an ongoing challenge. And our assessments of risk are likely to change as we age. Our um, decisions we make are therefore likely to change when we're aging, as we age, and that's okay. Um, but don't believe politicians that tell you and promise you, if we only do this, we can get rid of all threats and risks. That's just not true. And it never has been true in the history of life. And successful animals don't grossly overestimate the risks and grossly don't over respond by staying in their burrows all the time, but they're aware and they manage risks and there's lots of ways to manage risks. So I think that's the take home message from, from the book. Do something that scares you every day. Right. I like that one. Take away that effect of fear. And also, I think we would like to let the people know that we, as two people, are going to take care of all threats on the planet for everybody, so they will all be in good form. I failed at that. <laughs> With no risk whatsoever. That's classic. I am glad that we have... I, I, this is exactly my category. I like... Fear is one of my few categories that I really identify with. So I'm glad to speak about that. Very glad to speak with you. You are doing a lot. And when I say a lot, I mean a lot because I was thinking I might as well, I was going to look at a few of your papers that were online and then the list started to get disturbingly long. And I was like, we're not going to, we're not going to do that. I'm not going to get through that list. <laughs> I was like, I got through a few and I was like, wait a minute, let's, oh, oh. So it's very extensive. I work with great people and you know, for me, science is fun. It's a process. It's a way to learn about life and it's a way to collaborate with fun people. And I try to make win-win situations for everyone. I work with lots of undergrads and I learn a lot from them and if I'm not learning something new every day. What's it about? So I'm, I, I have the best job in the world. I um, feel very fortunate. This is true. It is fabulous. I will say it's wonderful to speak with you. And may the people check out The Nature of Fear. There will be an image and such. Hold it up, man. You got to hold it up. Show the book. This, Show the book. I, have it, I have it in paperial form. I have it in. <laughs> <laughs> but indeed, yours is way cooler with the snake in the front. And 
it would be great to have you on again in the future at some time. Until Happy to then. chat about other things. Mm -hmm. That would be wonderful. Glad to have you on and thank you for joining. Thanks for having me. You know it. And we are out. 